Good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to another edition of the Daily Factor. The date is Monday, 19th of July. And yes, it's just been a week since the unrest had unfolded right here in South Africa. And as a country, we are slowly but surely starting to heal and most of all trying to recover an economy which already took a battering due to COVID-19. Well, this week, members of government visited certain parts of the areas that were affected due to the looting and the violence that had happened. But the question is, what is the next plan in trying to get those ordinary citizens who are heavily affected by what had happened over the last week? Well, this uh, today, I'd like to introduce my guest that we are going to be speaking to for the next 45 to 50 minutes. Let me introduce Action SA leader, Mr. Herman Mashaba, Business Unity SA CEO, Mr. Kaskovadia, and in a while we'll be joined by political analyst, Angelo Fick. Uh, gentlemen, assalamu alaikum, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us. Wa alaikum salam, thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. No, thank you so much uh, for us uh, for giving us the opportunity and good afternoon to the listeners. No, it's an absolute pleasure. Mr. Herman Mashaba, I'm going to start off with you. I know last week uh, you had laid a charge against the cabinet uh, of uh, the Republic of South Africa. And the question we need to ask is just how far is it with regards to that? And how you know, disappointed are you as a politician, as somebody as seasoned as yourself to have seen what has transpired over the last week? No, thank you very much uh, for us. Uh, we, we've not laid uh, the charge and announced uh, the start of a process of uh, the action uh, the, the, uh, against the South African government, class action lawsuit. Uh, it's a very long, protracted, expensive uh, exercise, uh, but uh, I was with my lawyers at the press conference who have really committed to provide uh, the services for free to those who cannot afford uh, to really uh, uh, um, sue the South African government, starting with the President of the Republic of South Africa, uh, the President Cyril Ramaphosa, the Minister of Police and uh, the Security Cluster Ministers, including the ANC. And why the ANC? Because uh, this whole uh, destruction is as a result of uh, factional battles within the ANC. It's got absolutely nothing to do with us. Um, the President Cyril Ramaphosa has always made it abundantly clear to South Africans, and he's been un unapologetic about this, that his first priority in this country is the uh, um, unity of the ANC. I don't know where he puts us as South Africans, uh, third or fourth, but one thing for sure, his um, uh, the, uh, project and, and priority for the unity of, uh, of ANC ahead of South Africa, this is as a result of uh, these destructions that we witnessed the last uh, few weeks. And really very sad and angry about it. And um, we are we are now calling on the business community. If you look at our website, uh, so companies are registering, giving us the details so that uh, our legal team can start the process. And what is actually quite sad about it, but they can try. Uh, but I'm confident that ultimately the truth will prevail. They will. They are going to use your taxes and my taxes to frustrate uh, this case, uh, delayed as long as possible. But eventually, we are going to catch up with them because we've got enough evidence of their involvement uh, with this um, looting. This was not just the looting because our people were hungry. Uh, the looting uh, was uh, driven by another faction of the ANC uh, that want, wanted to really take over the, this country. And uh, our intelligence services cannot tell us that they were not aware about it. Mr. Kovari, I want to bring you into the conversation. Investor confidence. Now, uh, we did see last week uh, uh, the ratings agencies were saying, well, this is not going to have a direct impact on the ratings of uh, the economy. But surely if you're an investor outside of the country, there is a sense of concern, isn't there? So how do we now move ahead when the dust has settled to tell these investors, listen, South Africa is still a very attractive prospect for you to come ahead and invest well, yeah, this has dealt a severe blow to an environment that was already very fragile, if you like. Uh, the bottom line is that our country has been in a serious economic crisis for quite some time. 
uh, and COVID exacerbated that. Uh, but but COVID was felt in all across the globe. So lots of economies were impacted negatively by COVID. But the recent events have certainly made it extremely difficult to attract investment. Uh, and I think that that what we need to do, even though the rating agency said that they're not going to, it's not going to impact on the ratings, I think the issue that rating agencies had identified in putting us into sub-investment grade status still remain. And I think that irrespective of whether this was an insurrection or looting or any other matter, we must get to the bottom of that. The bottom line is that we need to make the necessary structural reform interventions in our economy. We need to create an environment for investment going forward, and that's going to take some very hard decisions that need to be made. And off the back of any investment we do get in, we're going to have to structure an inclusive growth and sustainable growth for our country. And that's the only way we address the social problem, the economic problem, and the fiscal crisis we find ourselves in. Jacobin, I want to I touch on leadership, and I'm going to start off with you, Mr. Mashaba. Leadership has been, obviously, the, the discussion that we've been having over the last week. Many of our citizens have really been questioning, you know, has the leadership been decisive? In your view, Mr. Mashaba, has there been a failure from leadership? And I'm not just talking uh, with specifically President Sol Ramaphosa, but the entire you know, security and economic cluster, and especially a time which has really been unprecedented for us as South Africans? Well, for us, um, uh, I challenge anyone uh, to do the research on my views regarding the leadership of President Cyril Ramaphosa. Uh, before he was elected as the president at NASREC, I raised a concern to the ANC that um, you elect uh, this man, you electing a wrong president uh, to lead uh, this country uh, that uh, Jacob Zuma had already destroyed. The Cyril Ramaphosa is not the man. They went ahead to elect him. Uh, two weeks before the elections, um, of the, the last elections in 2019, um, at the Constitutional Court, um, addressed a press conference and warning voters of South Africa that uh, you vote for this man 18 to 24 months later, you're going to be asking for Jacob Zuma to come back. And, and I'm not a prophet. I challenge anyone you can uh, check on that. And uh, we started seeing uh, the displeasure of the ANC against the Cyril Ramaphosa uh, long before COVID, more than a year before uh, the, the COVID. And uh, the President Cyril Ramaphosa has demonstrated beyond any reasonable doubt that is not the man that is going to really take this country out of the mess that we're in. But in fact, it's not just really Cyril Ramaphosa, the entire ANC, because the ANC is not a political organization. The ANC has proven to be a criminal enterprise uh, masquerading as a political, uh, as, a, as a, a criminal organization masquerading as a political party. So we are unfortunate as South Africa, as a country that the world was looking up to, to save this country that we find ourselves being led by an, a criminal syndicate. And I think it's, it's a fact that we've got more than enough evidence of ANC being a criminal organization. Look at what they've done to our country. I was in Soweto on, on Saturday, what they did to, to black businesses. This, there was, it was not just really a question of looting. They were actually destroying the inf infrastructure, burning down buildings so that people do not really uh, return to business uh, in a year or so. It's going to take uh, much longer. I was in Jabulani. People had to go to Rodipur to go and buy it, uh, bread. And how, uh, how do you to ask, uh, 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 I mean, reconcile this actually being driven by the, the, by the ANC? Another faction of the ANC, I'm not sure how many factions within ANC, we, right now we are aware of the two, you had one of them, it's actually involved in, in, in this mayhem, and uh, the president and his security clusters cannot really uh, take us for fools, that they don't know who, was, who are, who are the people responsible for this.
Mr. Kovadia, when you look at the ordinary citizen, and I'm going to take, as Mr. Mashaba was saying, in Soweto, I mean, the residents of Soweto are not, you know, they don't want to be involved in the factions within the, the ruling party. For them, it's all about, you know, having their businesses thriving, especially in an economy which has taken such a hit uh, because of COVID-19. And I'm going to mention speci specifically two, you know, uh, uh, stories that caught my mind. The one young black girl who had a BP garage when she invested so much of money, that has been mm -hmm. destroyed. And you have this gogo -go who has been, you know, having a business for so many years and this and her business was destroyed. And I saw it on Al Jazeera, the tears on her face. 11.4 million people are unemployed. This just further exacerbates, you know, the unemployment rate and the crisis that we're currently having in our country, doesn't it? No, it absolutely does. I mean, the, the cost of this, one cannot underestimate the cost of this. In fact, one can't even overestimate the cost of this. The Besides the cost to business, uh, investment, uh, small businesses in particular, uh, it's also, you know, and, and the small businesses do not have the resources to restart, to rebuild as, as, as other sectors of the economy would have, uh, but even that would be with difficulty. So absolutely the cost, particularly to small businesses has, is severe. I think we will still be measuring the cost of this in the next few months to come. We believe that this has put our economy back at least two years because a lot of the infrastructure that's been devastated and damaged, it will take a good few months to rebuild that infrastructure, to, to rebuild those businesses. Uh, it will exacerbate the unemployment situation. And I think over and above that, uh, also a tragic result of this is that it has caused fissures in society that we will have to start rebuilding in some form or other. Uh, the, the racial overtones the, uh, uh, are, are problematic. And, and, and I think these have been, in my view, instigated to a great extent. And, and so I think the, both the social cost, the economic cost, and the cost to society is going to still have to be measured of this. And the issue here is how do we move forward? Uh, we absolutely clear that the intelligence services of government were not there. Uh, we didn't have enough boots on the ground to actually deal with this. And I don't think uh, we, we dealt with it in a way that uh, our security forces should have dealt with it. So, so I think we, one, we need to start rebuilding, but two, I think we need to take a few steps back. And, and particularly in government, ask ourselves the questions, where did we fall short? Why did we fall short? And what do we do about it? Because I don't think this is the end, unfortunately. Uh, I think there are forces in the country that want to destabilize. And I think they will try to do so again. So we've got to be prepared for this. Yeah, well, our conversation is just getting started. Uh, do stay tuned to The Daily Factor. We'll be back after this break. Welcome back to The Daily Factor. Well, I'm glad to have uh, political analyst Angelo Fick uh, joining us. Uh, Angelo, I'm going to start uh, this segment with you. First of all, a good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us. Good afternoon to you, and your viewers. No, it's an absolute pleasure. Angelo, from a political perspective, I, this is, again, you know, factions within the ANC, you know, ganging up on each other, something which is supposed to be sorted out by the branches within the ruling party. It's sad, isn't it, that you know, us as South Africans have had to bear the brunt of a factional battle, which is not our business, isn't it? Yes, there is a tragedy of um, the internal dynamics of the African National Congress of the Governing Party of South Africa and what has happened since Nasrick in 2017. Uh, but I think it is, you know, sort of, it's very nice to be able to say that that's all ANC stuff, but we as a society also have to take some responsibility 
that the conditions were right in this country for people who were opportunities to exploit those divisions uh, in the ways that they did. Uh, the inequality was not built only by the African National Congress. They take a huge responsibility and should for that inequality, precisely by their policy and governance over the last 27 years. But we as a society also have to take responsibility because income inequality isn't ANC policy, it's ordinary South African practice. Um, the underpayment of workers and the maximizing and uh, prioritizing of profits over people by businesses, both large and not so large, those are you know, not ANC policy, those are everyday practices that ordinary South Africans experience, you know, independent of the African National Congress with no governance and maladministration. And so we need to stop, as Charles Savadi has pointed out, and reflect not just on how we're going to fix the immediate problem with the insecurity and um, other kinds of failures on the part of government, but how we're going to rejig, rethink, and reimagine the social fabric of the way we live, because how we got here is not just the result of a Jacob Zuma, Cyril Ramaphosa, internal ANC faction. It's also the result of constructing a society of massive inequality, massive deprivation, poverty, and joblessness. Um, that you know isn't the result only of ANC policy. So no, no exculpating or excusing the government party, but the rest of us need to take our share of blame and begin to think of ways out of the crisis that doesn't just involve fixing the ANC or replacing them with somebody else. Those problems won't go away when the ANC stops governing. Um, you know when they get elected up. Mr. Mashaba your tour to Jabulani Mall during the weekend and I followed you know some of it on, on social media and what was interesting mm -hmm. is that the people still have a determination to rebuild their lives but with the damage that has happened it's going to make life difficult isn't it especially in a community such as Soweto which has been the businesses there have been built to serve the people and serve that community in a way that it has a close-knit society to it just describe for us during that visit, you know, uh, the feelings of the people and, you know, do they really have trust in especially a ruling party that can really take them forward, you know, come the future? Well, so, so you know, the, the people are angry, the people are broken, uh, including myself. Uh, you know, what has really transpired uh, in this country the last 27 years and uh, uh, I can tell you to a large extent uh, the inequality that uh, Angela is speaking about uh, created by the ANC under the last 27 years. We are more unequal today than we were uh, pre-1994. Our schooling system, 80% of our public schools in this country are dysfunctional because of uh, ANC policies. Uh, um, uh, making sure that black people remain poor, black people remain uneducated. Uh, if you look at um, what COSATU has done with this labor the laws, we can talk about inequality uh, and, 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 uh, and, uh, uh, and, and so forth, but who created unemployment in, the, in, in this country? It's the ANC government. We have got what, sitting with over 43% of... of, of uh, of, uh, of unemployment. Oh, just under 12 million of our people are, are employed. And now you can imagine what uh, 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 this mess last week is going to contribute to further job bloodbath in, in our country. Who's been responsible? Kosachi, where they are uh, draconian, I call them draconian labor laws. And those draconian labor laws, who are they targeting to? SMMEs. If you look at um, businesses that could not really sustain uh, this draconian laws were small businesses because big business could uh, survive because they could afford to, to bring the best HR specialists and legal people to protect them against this. And over and above this, this big business obviously took this corrupt NCA uh, the people as their partner, so they were protected. But uh, the small businesses in the townships and in the villages, that's why you're going to any township, any village today. Uh, small businesses, um, or even big, proper businesses, which used to operate during the dark days of this country, they ANC annihilated them, destroyed uh, them. But how can then anyone say, well, we, we can blame colonialism on this? Yes, absolutely, we come from an evil system of apartheid. That's why we, all of us South Africans, uh, with the support of the international community, we defeated this evil called apartheid. But ultimately, 
the current mess we are in, for me, I give it 98%, if I'm positive uh, to the ANC's mismanagement, corruption, cater deployment, putting wrong people in the wrong, uh, in, in the wrong uh, position. So ANC, as far as I'm concerned, has got to take the responsibility for the mess that has happened, including the inequality that we're talking about. Mr. Kovadia, Cesaria uh, had said that, and, and I stand to be correct, uh, that in its assessments for insurance claims, we could be looking at 12 billion rand. Now, that's a huge number, and I don't know how much Cesaria has in them to help businesses. Now, big businesses, you know, they may just go back to their shareholders or the investors and say, you know what, can we have a, you know, a repumping of money back into our businesses? But eventually, it's going to be the SMMEs. If the insurance does not go through, they're going to be the ones suffering, aren't they? Yeah, so, so and, and that's why I think, you know, on the one side, we can look for the reasons for this and we can criticize the shortfall and the weaknesses. But on the other side, we need to start picking things up. Uh, we, and, and we've, engaged on this, in fact, last week at NEDLAC. And I think labor and business are at Edom that we need to put together some sort of a national disaster relief fund. Uh, subsequent to that, the Solidarity Fund has also come, come to the party to say uh, they are prepared to administer funds that people might want to put in. So we are certainly asking for donations for business from big businesses and others to actually start picking up all of this to start assisting SMEs that have had a, a significant uh, knock as a result of this. Uh, lots of food has been sent down to Basel and Natal over the last few days. Uh, so, so we working on efforts to see how we ameliorate the situation how we try to assist those who have been at the, uh, uh, those that have suffered significantly from this. Uh, and, and we hope that in the next week or so, we make a significant impact on that. So yes, we, I mean, small businesses need to be, need to be assisted. Uh, where there are food shortages and other shortages, we need to be working on that and lots of food has gone down. The other issue that we've also, a lot of medical equipment has gone down, medical uh, products because those were in short supply. And the other thing that we're doing and, and we're working quite hard at is to begin to work on the vaccination program because the vaccination program took a severe knock as a result of this. In, when the violence started, uh, we sort of lost probably 60 to 70,000 vex people that we could have vaccinated per day. Uh, we're beginning to pick that up again, but uh, that's another critical issue that we need to tackle. And related to that is I think we're still going to see the impact of this in, in uh, infections going up because all of these people were breaking COVID violations and I think infections will go up. Mr. Mashaba, last night, and you know, it was just something that, that just surprised me, but at the same time didn't surprise me because we heard uh, Defense Minister Nosifiwe Mapisa Nkakula saying, and this is 48 hours after President Saul Ramaphosa said that this was an insurrection that was carried out to damage the South African economy and its infrastructure. The defense minister then says, well, there was no insurrection. And I'm just thinking to myself, surely you guys have to agree on something because you guys are part of the same cabinet, but it doesn't seem that way. Absolutely. I think uh, you ask yourself, Faraz, uh, how you can have a minister like that who's supposed to be in jail uh, right now, involved uh, in human trafficking, using state resources, and uh, how uh, President Sel Ramaphosa uh, decided to put someone like that uh, to be the, in his cabinet. Uh, it's a mystery. It's unimaginable that um, it, it's a well-known fact uh, that criminal charges, uh, official criminal charges were laid against uh, this minister for human trafficking, 
I do, I do, I'm sure you're aware that South Africa is actually one of the biggest countries when it comes to human trafficking. Are you aware that uh, South Africa, if you want to see uh, modern day slavery, let me take you in the city of Johannesburg. Look at all these hijacked buildings. Go and see modern day slavery where people, uh, young people are brought from all over the world, brought to, to into the city of Johannesburg and other cities, I believe. But I've got evidence of, of uh, modern day slavery in the city of Johannesburg because uh, South Africa is a dumping site for expired and uh, counterfeit goods. Brought into this country illegally, these car businesses don't pay any taxes, they don't employ South, South, South Africans. And this is happening in a country where you've got the, 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 the Minister of Defense, you've got Minister of Intelligence, you've got Minister of Police. Look at the police. How do you expect uh, a modern police uh, to be led uh, by the Taylor Hood, Minister Putrele, who even Jacob Zuma himself could not keep him in, in his uh, cabinet. You know what the, the, his case regarding the, 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 the South African police uh, headquarters in Pretoria and, and Devon. Even Jacob Zuma could not obviously to keep him in his cabinet. But then the President Russell Ramaphosa comes in appoints this very same people. If you look at his cabinet, you look at uh, his members of parliament, look at all the people who are leading key uh, positions uh, in, in parliament, um, cha chairpersons or portfolios, these are all uh, the, uh, the, the Zuma people who are supposed to be in jail today. Now, how do you expect society, a normal society, to function when people of Soweto, they know very well that we are being led by criminals? So we've got a huge challenge on, on our hands. That's why uh, 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 the minister of uh, Mapisa can say all these things because he knows uh, that Cyril Ramaphosa is not going to act against him. Look at uh, Zuelim Kizi who has admitted refunding the money for, for the, the, that was uh, the, the paid to him. But he's on holiday now, earning 2.8 million rents with uh, all the VIP protection. You and I, the people of Soweto today, as I said to you, not even not having money to buy bread. They don't have a place where they can buy bread. Angelo, I remember uh, four years ago uh, during the Power FM chairman's conversation and uh, former President Thabo Mbeki, and I, I'll always remember this quote where he says, there has to be a consensus within cabinet to make a decision. I just want to know, Angelo, was there ever a consensus when it came to the topic about insurrection? I don't think that there has been, um, you know, some kind of, conspiracy to cover up. I think what you have is major disagreements within cabinet about uh, matters and how to describe them and what goes forward. So you have secure class inside cabinet who really have state power as their interest. And you have others who are not as secure classic because they come out of that tradition who may differ from that view. Now, in the defense cluster, in the policing and security clusters, you're likely to hear secure classic talk um, and dissent about that. And there's also dissent between the Minister of Defence and the Minister of Police about the function of intelligence and how that came about. Now, this is not new. We saw this in the xenophobic violence responses from government where they disagreed with one another about whether or not it was xenophobic violence or whether to call it Afrophobic violence or whether to call it criminality. And this kind of dissent is not new. Um, but it isn't for me a major kind of issue of schism. I'd rather have the visibility of that dissent than have dissent and disagreements, you know, suppressed, which we saw in the Mbeki cabinet. And, and we paid the price for that lack of ability to speak out by ministers of cabinet and show us that, that there isn't agreement. My concern is that we can rake over the coals of where we are at the moment, that we really do need to start thinking, as Kelsey Badu has pointed out, and as Mr. Mashaba has pointed, as Homer has pointed out, we need to start thinking of how we need to fix this problem. And it isn't just to fix them with the economic problem, it's also to fix them with the social problem. And that means we have to start paying attention to communities and their forms of organization, because it is the minority of people in South Africa who are members of political parties. Most South Africans aren't members of political parties or even trade unions. They're members of football clubs, churches, church choirs, mosques, shuls. They belong in all sorts of other places that are not political parties, and that's where they do their politics. And it is that network of organizations, alongside the community action networks that responded to the COVID crisis of last year and the freedom security, 
that we as ordinary people and smaller organizations and large organizations need to tap into, learn from, and begin to rebuild communities outside of just what political parties um, are doing. Because, you know, unlike Mr. Mashaba, I don't have a political campaign and I'm not running for election later this year. So I fully understand what he is doing and how he's talking about the situation. My concern is um, for the larger, you know, population in South Africa that aren't particularly invested as members of political parties and what they are going to do and how they need to be supported in those actions. As we've seen, communities respond already, cleaning up, standing guard over places, and beginning to help people out with food. This is not a country that only works in political party terms. It works very much in those other network terms that we need to start strengthening. Well, gentlemen, we'll be back after the break to continue this conversation. Do stay tuned. Welcome back to The Daily Fact. I'm continuing my conversation with political analyst Angelo Fick, Action SA leader Herman Mashaba, and Business Unity CEO Kes Kuvadia. Mr. Kuvadia, I'm going to come to you. I think sometimes we, we understated the importance of, uh, you know, highways. And, you know, we always think of the N3 highway as, some, as a highway that, you know, where we take our families to on holidays to go to uh, the KwaZulu-Natal province, but we don't really, you know, see... The, the bigger picture of it in terms of how it contributes to the economy. And last week was an example of it, of its importance to us, and especially the supply of your basic food stuff and, of course, that of petroleum. Uh, if something like this ever has to happen again, and God forbid it does, just, just how bad would it hit, you know, us as an economy right over here, and especially that highway where, you know, the supply of goods to and from, from Johannesburg, to KwaZulu-Natal and, you know, the other way around, vice versa? Well, the entry is obviously a major arterial road. Uh, we do a lot of our transporting of essential materials uh, along the entry. And, and I think that there's always been a view that, uh, and, and it's not the first time. I mean, trucks have been burnt before. Mm. This isn't the first time that this has happened, and when trucks had been burned before and so on, we saw the impact of that. So we certainly of the view that we need to, one of the lessons from this is that the entry is the national key point, essentially, and we need to ensure that it is appropriately protected. We need to ensure that uh, we have sufficient intelligence, uh, and I'm talking about uh, intelligence networks in the government to actually warn us of any such occurrences in future, and on the basis of such intelligence to actually ensure that a, a, an, an arterial like the N3 is appropriately protected. So, so yeah, I mean, you saw that damage to trucks, and that's a severe economic impact. You saw that because it had to be closed, uh, essential goods and services couldn't be transported from Gauteng, which is the economic center of the country, to other parts of the, of the country, particularly to Padua Natal. And we are now seeing the impact of that. So, you know, it's the entry, it's our ports, it's, it's, it's uh, businesses that uh, uh, manufacture critical chemicals uh, and, and other critical points of manufacturing for the country. So it's not that we didn't know the importance of the M3, but again, as lessons from this, uh, one of the critical lessons from this and one of the critical things we need to look at is why was there such a shortfall in our intelligence about this. We should have picked these things up. We should have prepared for uh, the potential up, uh, fallout from the uh, imprisonment of Jacob Zuma. And th those are the sort of discussions we need to have and lessons we need to learn. And this is where I want to bring you in, Angelo, because we saw the campaign of uh, hashtag free Zuma on 
Friday, the 16th of July, they had given government uh, 14 days to release the former president. Now, I shudder to think what may or may not happen if that does not, if their demands are not met. But surely we can't be kept in a state of ransom, Angelo, like this, because another incident that we have, like what we had last week, I mean, this will be far worse than what we saw last week from an economic and just a security-wise. Yes, uh, it remains baffling to me that people who are secure crap who looked at um, those messages from people inside or claim, who claim to be inside the Zuma supporter camp in the days ahead of his um, case being taken to prison, uh, in which they threatened precisely the kinds of things we saw. Um, we had people in live television and radio interviews telling us this is what they're going to do. Um, some of us took those threats seriously because, you know, even if we didn't expect the kind of violence we did, we did think these people were serious and would do some kind of uh, protest damage. The fact that government didn't respond is a blight on, and the president may have admitted to it, that he will have to pay the price for it at some point, and the legislature needs to hold him accountable, and his ministers. Um, and there, I think, um, Herman Mashaba's point is correct, that these are people who are sitting in cabinet, who have their jobs, and the legislature should act on them, um, regardless of party affiliation, and indicate that this is unacceptable. Um, government, again, cannot be held to ransom by people who threaten the population. This is unacceptable. We do not live in that kind of state. Uh, anybody who does so ought to be arrested and should be dealt with by the National Prosecuting Authority and the civil justice system. We cannot sit in a situation where literally gangsters are holding the rest of us to ransom, saying if you don't do what we want, we will do this other thing that is entirely illegal. If this happened in a neighborhood, the police would intervene. If I went into your house and held you hostage and suggested that you must deliver so many cans of food to me or otherwise people are going to start being, you know, damaged, this, this would be considered ordinary criminality. And this is, I think, where we have to go. And we have to learn from the rest of the continent who has been warning us since 2008 that the dynamics of post-apartheid South Africa bear out the dynamics of post-independent African states. And we need to take those lessons to heart and begin to, one, support our institutions, two, get rid of paramilitaries. We have one South African National Defence Force. No other organisation should be allowed to have some kind of military organisation with marches and some kind of remembrance of something. Okay. And it's unacceptable in a, in a peaceful democracy. And so those transformations are definitely things that the African National Congress and its employees in central government, national government, have to start effecting because the fanfare has now become something real that we have to pay for. And that's it, uh, isn't it, uh, Mr. Mashaba? I mean, we've got, uh, as uh, Angelo is saying, you know, another paramilitary organization, the MKMPA, who are staunch supporters of uh, former President Jacob Zuma. But it's not just them. It's his son, Duduzane Zuma, saying, and I quote, loot responsibly. And then you've got his daughter saying, well, we're going to bring on more of this if you do not release my father. And I'm just thinking to myself, this could be a perfect script for a Hollywood movie, for one big blockbuster Hollywood director to come and direct it. But this is happening in reality. And this reality is hurting us as South Africans, that we are being held ransom for a president who has been found to be in contempt of court and has charges to his name. And... We are just asking ourselves, we can't be held to ransom by just one single person. Let me tell you, Faraz, uh, if, if, if I had my way, um, within the constitutional framework of the Republic of South Africa, um, the president's supposed to actually be leading a charge um, for the arrest of uh, the people behind us. And before the end of this week, appear on national television with the people behind this mayhem that they've caused in chains to demonstrate to South, South Africans, to give us confidence again that he's serious about, uh, about uh, this. Get these people arrested. We, I have called on the president long before we started seeing uh, the destruction that we experienced over the last week. When they started banning trucks on the, on, uh, on the Moy River Plaza, I said, Mr. President, uh, please bring the army in to assist the police because it appears that the police do, do not have the capacity. Please put together 24-hour courts so that every time someone is arrested for this, they are given a fair trial, open trial, so that those who are found guilty, they must immediately go to jail when they when, uh, accompany Jacob Zuma in jail. Those who are free, let them free because there's no evidence against them. 
But right now we're talking about the president that is telling us uh, that we're looking for Mandela magic to solve South Africa's problem. I mean, it's, it's one of the most ridiculous statements you can hear from a president with a country that is facing one of the most uh, really dangerous situation in the world. I'm really asking President Joseph Amaposa, get your security clusters every hour to give an update uh, what they're doing because you want before the end of this week, uh, you want to appear on national television with the so-called family meetings. You must then uh, come and present uh, these people who are responsible. Have them in chains in front of the nation that we caught them, we've got them, and we are going to make sure that they face the consequences. That is the only time I can have confidence back uh, in, in the rule of law in this country because our constitution does allow us. And the president has to demonstrate to the criminals that... Uh, the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa does not tolerate um, uh, inept in action of government, which uh, President Sir Ramaphosa right now is displaying. Gentlemen, I think I think we can all agree that as South Africans, when we when we faced with uh, challenges, you know, we see uh, us as a nation from all different races and genders coming together and really wanting to play a role to. You know, even if it is patching up the country, we do it. And I'm going to start off with you, Mr. Kovadia, the role of communities, the role of NGOs, and just the ordinary citizen who took a broom and said, I'm going to sweep up all the mess that has been created. That's a good sign, isn't it? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and I think one of the critical issues, and it's not just now, but a number of us have been sort of looking at uh, for the last year or two, is how we can ensure a resurgence of civil society. Because I think any, any strong democracy is only as strong as its civil society component because it's through those uh, components of society. As Angelo said earlier, it's the, it's the soccer club, it's the sports club, it's the religious organizations, it's the uh, uh, neighborhood, uh, you know, residents and ratepayer associations. It's it's uh, street committees in townships. All of those sort of uh, structures through which people actually participate. It's stock fells and 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 so on. And and we need to ensure that those sorts of structures have the space to uh, uh, find their voice or to, to actually promote their voice. Uh, they've got a voice and the voice needs to be promoted. And I think it's through those structures that we hold people in power to account. Uh, and it's those structures that are on the ground, close to people, and it's those structures that can actually uh, ensure that we have a, a democracy, not only every five years when we vote, but we have governance uh, in between elections and we hold people to account. And that is, is it, isn't it, uh, Angelo, civil society? And we saw civil society coming out so strong, and we see all the social media videos coming. This is what makes South Africa great, isn't it? Even though we have this dark time, you know, that has been plunged on us, there still is that slight, slight light at the end of the tunnel. Yes, and I'm more hopeful than you seem to be. I don't think the light is slight. I think the light um, <laughs> quite brightly. Um, one of the things I also think South Africans need to acknowledge is that we're not alone in the world in facing these kinds of uh, challenges. Um, and somebody like George Monbiot, the British writer, pointed out that it is precisely by re-energizing democracy from the bottom up, by getting people to own the spaces they live in, own the spaces, and I don't just mean in the literal uh, sense of being owners of, but to feel as if they belong to those spaces and that those spaces belong to them, that you build these kinds of civic responses where people refuse to let the minority determine the life that they have to struggle out um, in, in these spaces. And that's what these communities did when they stood together to guard infrastructure that they didn't literally own, but that they belonged to and that they felt belonged to them. And if that can be you know, stretched out to include parks, streets, pavements, sports complexes, um, hospitals, clinics, libraries, primary schools, high schools, if that can be instilled, if people can begin to build on what they did over the last 10 days, um, and then government will have to respond because communities can then 
use their ability to call this their own, to call it their belonging and their belongings, and as the government to improve those conditions, the local councillors will have to respond. Because I think national government is very far away, local government is very immediate, as councillors will tell you, and people aren't happy to come to them to complain. And it is those councillors, whether they're independent or party members, who need to be empowered by communities and need to be held with two account by communities, so that it isn't the party's dictates to determine what happens in a community, but the community's desires and their ability to agitate with those councillors. And that is, I think, what we can take from this moment of crisis and build on uh, to improve things. Mr. Mashaba, I'm going to let you have the last uh, word on this before we go to the break. You know, the name of Ntlantla Lux, uh, the the NGOs like Gift of the Givers, the 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 gogo on the street who was cleaning up, you know, the gogo who's, you know, not supposed to be doing it because, you know, she's got her complicated health problems, but they stood out and she got the assistance from various other communities to clean the streets. Those are the real heroes of South Africa, aren't they, Mr. Mashaba? Without any doubt, uh, Sarat and, uh, and the other panelists, uh, I think uh, civil society activism uh, it's key uh, to de the development uh, on and the progress of any society. However, if it is not supported by the rule of law, where you have the government that actually sabotages what civil society does, then it's not sustainable. You need to really live in a society, in a country where the rule of law is supreme, so that civil society can participate and really know that uh, they work in an environment where the government is not, not, it's on their side. Unlike in our particular case right now, look at uh, this uh, uh, mess we're in right now, caused by government. Look at the inequality caused by government. Look at the racial uh, 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 issues that we, we are having uh, right now as society. We are more divided than we were in 1994, where we, we still have uh, the, the people called blacks, white, uh, Indian, color. Yes, we, 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 we are ever black man. You, you're uh, someone of an Indian descent. But we must first be South Africans. 27 years into our democracy, we are still uh, first, uh, I must be black, or another one must be colored, white. I think it's, you know, it's, it's a failure of um, our democratic South Africa. And I think if we are serious about sustainable uh, initiatives, we need the rule of law. We need a government that the civil society can hold accountable. South Africans must also learn to understand that if you want peaceful transition and a prosperous one, learn to vote governments in, vote to learn governments out. You cannot allow a situation where you, you, you allow a, a party to abuse you for 27 years. They don't owe you anything. You owe, don't owe them anything. What you do, vote political parties out. It doesn't matter who. Vote them out when they, when they don't deliver. Vote them in if you've got confidence with them. But you don't have to give them 27 years. We live in a constitutional democracy where every two and a half years, you as voters, you have an opportunity to punish these politicians. But unfortunately, South Africans are making a terrible mistake by wanting to stay out of, uh, out of voting in and out of politicians. That, and that's where a, a party like ANC wants that because they know that their support base is dwindling, dwindling fast. But at the same time, people are losing interest in, in participating uh, in terms of deciding who the leadership of the country is. Well, stay tuned to the conversation. We are going to be wrapping it up and then we will be, of course, going to our COVID stats and newspapers. Do stay tuned. Welcome back to the Daily Fact. Gentlemen, we literally are going to be giving you just a minute each just to give your parting shots. Uh, starting off with you, Angelo, there's been talk of cabinet reshuffle. Is that in any way possible going to change the scenario that we are in at this moment? I don't think so. We need a cabinet reduction. We need the executive and the members of the legislature to actually you know, take a massive pay cut and pour that money into the relief mechanisms for communities. And we need a rejigging of the system. We need to re-democratize South Africa from the bottom up. Um, it, it changes at the top are not going to be enough. Uh, we need to get beyond this addiction to leadership 
which is basically dealership and actually get back into building democracy from the bottom up. Uh, Haman, uh, do you, uh, what, do, what, do we, what needs to happen if there is going to be a potential uh, a cabinet reshuffle? And are you confident that whoever does come in, that they will be, you know, strong enough, wise enough to counter whatever, you know, second wave of these insurrections could happen? Well, I think uh, it would have been uh, wonderful uh, if uh, uh, the president can provide leadership uh, in having a, a, a cabinet reshuffle. In fact, it does not need a cabinet reshuffle. I can tell you we did an exercise. This country can run with a maximum of 20 ministers. You don't need deputy ministers. You can save billions and hold these uh, people accountable. But unfortunately, uh, Shiraz, that is not going to happen under Cyril Ramaphosa. Very unfortunate. Uh, it's not something that it's, it is my wish, and I know it's not going to happen. So Ramaphosa's uh, agenda is the unity of the ANC. Uh, Mr. Kuvari, I'm going to let you have the, the, the final say. The economy, that is the bread and butter of us as South Africans. And 11.4 million people are currently unemployed. After last week, I mean, can we at least see some sort of ray of light for our economy to at least slowly recover, even though we have what we had last week and the pandemic at this moment? Well, we've got to push on. I mean, we engage with government even for quite, quite a few months on an economic recovery strategy that we developed in the middle of last year. We believe that there are some stuff that can be done quickly and some of those fortunately in the last month or so have happened, the raising the ceiling of embedded energy, the uh, RFP for the new tranche of renewable and so on. But these are things that could have been done quite some time ago. We need to act with urgency. Government needs to act with urgency and pull some levers that are governments to pull. And, and I think that we need to make it easy for businesses to actually do business in the country. But taking Angelo's point earlier that we need to rebuild an economy that is inclusive, an economy that excludes the majority of the people in the country cannot be sustainable. And it's got to be in all our interests to do that. Gentlemen, I'd like to say thank you so much uh, for joining us. Haman Mashaba, Action thank SA you. Leader, Kaskuvadia Business Unity, South Africa CEO, and Angelo Fick, Political Analyst. It has been an absolute pleasure hosting all three of you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Uh, salam. Uh, well, there we go. Uh, great conversation that we had had right now. And just hopefully whatever has been said, you know, is a a reflection of what so many South Africans are feeling at this very moment, an economy that includes every single one of us for us to play a part right here in this beautiful land of us, which is South Africa. Well, let's go quickly to our COVID-19 statistics and another 11,215 cases of COVID-19 had been detected with unfortunately 183 people dying. The 183 deaths brings the total number of fatalities to 66,859 Another 400 people were admitted to hospital. Well, let's go to the Muslim statistics. And Gauteng again continues to be the highest number of death rates right here in South Africa amongst Muslim communities. 43 new deaths were recorded, with 23 of them being in Gauteng. Let's go to our newspapers. Time for Cyril to clean a house, as the conversation I was having. Uh, with our panelists, are we going to be seeing a cabinet reshuffle? Well, we wait to see what happens this week. A picture of Sol Ramaphosa right here in a Jabulani Mall in Soweto to commemorate Nelson Mandela Day. Let's go to the back page of The Citizen. And an unsettling week, South Africa preparing its test week against the British and Irish Lions. So we wait to see what's going to be happening with regards to the Springboks, a number of COVID-19 cases that has happened. Well, on the left-hand side, not so good news in the uh, football front. A red card was a huge factor as Kaiser Chiefs lost the CAF Champions League final against Al-Ahli 3-0 in Morocco. And Kosafa Cup comes home. Well, there we go. Some sort of positivity. Bafana Bafana winning the Kosafa Cup after beating Senegal 5-4 on penalties. We go to the Mail and Guardian. Just the beginning, and this is what uh, experts are warning insiders say, burning and looting is phase one 
of a coordinated plan to destabilize the country. Now, phase two involves burning resources. We hope that that does not happen any time soon. We then go to the star. And Zuma won't do virtual hearing, what currently at this very moment, his court case is underway. Uh, and we wait to see what happens with regards to that. And Ramaphosa changes tune on ethnic comment, a comment that he made last week when he addressed the nation on Monday, the 12th of July. We then go to the capital city of Tuane, Pretoria News. Ramaphosa in an ethnic U-turn, going with the same headline that the star had. President backtracks on earlier claims that such a form of mobilization led to looting and writing. And then on the left-hand side, disagreement of a method as Zuma is back in due to court. Another one there uh, down. Limpopo taxi driver severely assaulted, torture suspected, looter. Well, some form of, uh, you know, mob justice happening. And hopefully the police will be able to go ahead and investigate the cause of the looting. Let's go to the Western Cape, the Cape Times. Kaya shows its Ubuntu side. Kaya Licha, of course, you know, going ahead and playing their part during the uh, the uh, current uh, looting that happened. Of course, uh, sorry, that is the Cape Argus. I'm going to go to the Cape Argus there. Uh, it was not ethnic mobilization. This is according to President Cyril Ramaphosa. But we then go to the next newspaper, and that is the Cape Times. And I was saying Kaya shows its Ubuntu side as the uh, community of Kaya Licha gets together. And Mr. Fix Mbalula visits fails to unite rival taxi groups. And the other one, Mandela, a sobering reminder in aftermath of the chaos. We then go to the KwaZulu-Natal newspapers, the Daily News, and its headline saying, Instigators will be arrested. This is according to Police Minister Becky Trele. We then go to the other KwaZulu Natal newspaper, and that's the Mercury, and move to quell racial tensions. This is, of course, in light of what had happened in the community in Phoenix. Peace committee to set up in parts of Durban, hit by high unrest. And on the right hand side, KZN on high alert, but new threat to shut down province. Well, that's all we have for you here with regards to the newspapers and the Daily Factor. Do remember from Thursday, we will be back to normal programming. We'll, of course, be discussing sports, the markets, community news, and various other facets of the Daily Factor. You do have yourself a good day. Most importantly, keep safe, keep warm during this cold weather, and we will see you, inshallah, God willing, in the rest of the week. From myself, for Patel, and the rest of the production team, uh, Tony, Linda, Ellen, and Jesse. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.